We're still rolling. All right, here it is. In three, two, one. It kills me to say this because my parents were both public school teachers and my nieces are public school teachers, and my sister-in-law is the principal in a public school, and I am a grateful product of America's public school system. But today, that system is broken. Not everywhere, but in far too many places, and the evidence is undeniable. All over the country, in dozens of big cities, many thousands of kids are graduating from high school who are functionally illiterate. Thousands more have zero proficiency in basic math. Zero. Obviously, it's unfair to blame the teachers for everything. There are lots of environmental factors that complicate the problem, but that doesn't change the fact that we're failing to educate our kids on the basics. Moreover, we're not treating them like individuals. Everybody knows that kids don't learn in the same way, and yet, for generations, we've acted as if they do. Todd Rose thinks that's a really bad idea, and Todd would know. There are like so many things I want to discuss with you, and I, I scarcely know where to begin. So let's start with, hello again, nice to see you. You too. Thanks for having me. You basically flunked out of high school, 0 0.9 GPA, and you somehow wound up to be a professor at Harvard. What the hell, man? I grew up in rural America. It prized conformity above almost everything else, and that was never gonna fit with my personality. And I just had a really, really tough time. If you do poorly in one year, you're <laughs> probably gonna do poorly in the next year. And it snowballed and I stopped caring and come early my senior year, I'd like to say we mutually decided that I wouldn't come to school anymore, but the, the truth was they just said, you can't come anymore. And so I dropped out. I just kept bouncing around jobs. I would do these not great jobs and get bored and try something else. And people were really frustrated with me. What people? Family? <laughs> I assume. <laughs> Family, yeah. Well, in this case, the general term people probably covers it. But, um, you know, look, it also uh, made me appreciate the next steps in my journey. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I just knew I had to do something. So I got my GED and I went to Weber State University. I'm sitting in a big auditorium in a history class with my buddy Steve. I knew it wasn't good for me, big lecture hall. And as the class is ending, I complained to Steve. I said, this is just terrible. And he says, this is nothing compared to what I've got myself into in the honors program. There are no lectures. They're just these small groups of like 10 to 12 people. And he said, there are no tests. All we do is argue. And I'm like, you could learn by just arguing. And that's like Sunday night at the Rose House, right? Like sure. this sounds awesome. And so I just got super impulsive and I was like, man, I gotta be in this thing. And I go up to the secretary, a woman named Marilyn Diamond. I said, I, I wanna be in the honors program. And she said, well, that's great. Let's let's get you in to see the director. I, I go into his office and I start explaining to him. I want to be in the honors program. And he said, well, I just have a couple of questions. Let's just get this application out of the way. He's like, you know, what was your uh, high school GPA? <laughs> I said, point nine. And this is no kidding. His response was, what point nine? <laughs> As if I'd left <laughs> off the, the most important number. So then I'm like, 0 0.9. And he just looks at me and he was really nice about it. He said, you can't be in the honors program. <laughs> and as I'm going out of the room, Marilyn Diamond, the secretary, and she said, hey, look, if you want this, don't take no for an answer. And she said, just sit on the couch and don't leave until he lets you in. After quite a while, he finally sticks his head out. He says, Todd, come, come in here. He said, look, why, why do you want to be in the honors program? Because on paper, it doesn't make any sense. So I explained to him what I'd learned about myself and my own individuality. And he decided to let me in on a provisional basis. Fast forward. I ended up graduating as the Honor Student of the Year with a 3.97 GPA in psych and on my way to Harvard for my doctorate. It's pretty clear looking back for me that would inform a lot of my work on understanding individuality and human potential and the profound role of a good fit. I think we internalize like, if it doesn't work in the standardized system, I must be dumb. You've written a bunch of books and in every book, it's a version of saying, maybe that one size fits all thing isn't really gonna cut it. And not to paint with too broad a brush, but isn't that the big enemy in your life? Cookie cutter advice? That's it. We built these big industrial systems and they bought us something in terms of efficiency, but I believe it cost us a lot. We've standardized everything, including what it means to live a good life, what kind of jobs are valued, what we should aspire to. 
and then also how we do it. We're all born into this, and so we think it's just true. Or at least somebody smarter than we are figured it out, and it must be the best way. For me, it's just absolutely spectacularly wrong. People's individuality is not selfishness, and it's not something to ignore. That distinctiveness is everything. For me, I want to get to work, but I don't think we can do it until we sort of peel back a few layers on the education side. Mass production is a great thing, the Model T, but people aren't cars. Right. And so <laughs> how in the world did we turn our public education yeah. system into this thing that just reeks of all of the factory protocols that I've ever right. seen. We have one one guy to thank for this, and it's a guy named Frederick Taylor. He invented a thing called scientific management. Most people have never heard of him, but we're all living in his shadow, oh. and it sucks. He went about saying, hey, we're wildly inefficient at work. He believed for everything there was one right answer. Every single job, there should be one right way to do it. He actually flat out told people when they'd give advice, he said, I don't want your initiative. I don't want your advice. <laughs> I want you to do the thing we're telling you and do it quickly. That's your job. He invented the concept of a manager that didn't exist. And he creates this layer of people who plan and people who do. And he hated the people that did. I mean, it's the color of collars. It's the classic binary trap, blue or white. You must choose. We're living in this world now where it's this or that, good, bad, right, wrong, left, right, you know, blue collar, white collar. This, he sounds like one of the true culprits. There are efficiencies and benefits to standardizing products. He takes it and decides we're gonna treat people as interchangeable. He said in the past, people were first. In the future, the system has to be first. That was so foreign to Americans at the time. Suddenly we get this rush of standardization of products, we're benefiting from that. Then not surprisingly, once you start applying it to work, you got a cottage industry of people saying, well, wait a minute, what about the institution that supplies work, <laughs> education? Mm -hmm. And so we're like rushing to standardize that. And that's where we get like the bells that say it's time to move on to the next class. They denigrated individuality. People are interchangeable parts. That's the point. We've lived with that for a while. We've gotten a lot of efficiency out of it. We've got a lot of material abundance, but it has cost us our soul. And we're left at this place now where kids go through the same factory-based education system that has a singular goal at this point, which is prepare kids for college. But this is what we've become. So we don't care what kids care about. We don't care about teaching people the value of hard work, that people have dignity and derive some sense of fulfillment from doing work that's meaningful. And we're paying a price for it. That's the bad news. Good news is we know how to get out of it. The best predictor of whether you will find work meaningful is the extent to which it fits with your individuality. You care about X, Y, and Z, go do that and do it well. The second thing is that you put your all into it. Because not every job has to be a perfect fit, but that doesn't mean you don't show up and give it your all. The actual effort and commitment to any work that you do pays off in terms of greater sense of meaning and purpose. I actually think most of the self-discovery, it's in the doing of things. You can spend forever navel-gazing. That doesn't hold a candle to just jump in and do something. You might find out, like I did, there's certain things you really hate. That's actually really good, right? Do a good job at it. You learn about yourself based on what you like and don't like, and you work your way toward a better and better fit. I remember very clearly the moments in my life when I realized that just because you loved something doesn't mean you're not capable of sucking at it. Mm -hmm. And just because you're not particularly enamored of a thing doesn't mean you might not have a great facility for it. Your passion is important, but maybe you don't follow it. Maybe this thing that you believe you were put on the earth to do doesn't line up with your gifts or vice versa. I agree, passion is tricky. Advising people to look a little deeper, which is your underlying motives, right? Not just passion. There are certain things that just motivate you. And if you can get in touch with those things through trial and error, there are so many combinations of jobs that can activate those motives. Like in an ideal scenario, what do we want? We want people doing work that they're good at and that they care about. If you had both of those things, watch out, because this is where it becomes truly mutually beneficial. People are deriving not only a paycheck, but they are getting personal fulfillment out of it. And when people are highly engaged like that, they tend to be more productive, more creative, more innovative. So we all benefit. So we've proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that you can create material abundance. But 
What's the point of materialism if not psychological abundance, if not happiness and flourishing and fulfillment? And it's there, weirdly, that we keep structuring our institutions and our cultural norms as if somebody has to lose. We know exactly what the conditions are that have to be in place to get both material and psychological abundance. And you can only do that in a free society because it requires a commitment to individuality and a deep belief and trust in individuals working together to address our challenges. We can do that here.